Bonjour à tous, bonjour à toutes. Bienvenue, welcome uh, pour cette, uh, ces deux semaines de, de cours. Welcome for these two weeks of uh, introduction to economics that will be taught by uh, Abhijit Banerjee and myself. Before getting into the, uh, the courses itself and the, the substance of the matter, let me uh, start with some housekeeping uh, details. We have uh, students from uh, PSL, uh, PSE, Ecole Normale, etc. attending on Zoom. And we have uh, many of you attending via the YouTube live stream. We will welcome participation from both of uh, these groups. For anybody on Zoom, if you have a question while I'm talking, please raise your blue hand on Zoom and uh, summarize very briefly your question on the chat. For anybody on YouTube, please type down your question on, uh, in the chat that you see on the right side of your screen. We have uh, two wonderful uh, moderators, Louise and Eric, uh, who will uh, um, stream and select the question. I will stop every 10 minutes or, or so to give you a chance to ask any questions any question you have, okay? So if you have questions and you're on Zoom, they are going to ask you to unmute and speak your question uh, um, uh, yourself uh, when I stop for questions every 10 minutes or so. If you are on the stream, you will have typed your question and they will uh, uh, voice it for you. They will be your uh, uh, ears and voice on the ground. And I will answer this question as we go. So I hope uh, that is uh, more or less clear. And now let me start. I'm really delighted to have this chance to uh, give this course uh, in a pretty un unusual time uh, for the world. A time where we are confronting problems that many of us never expected to be confronted with, both uh, in rich countries and uh, perhaps even more in the poorest country we are thinking uh, in particular about the hardship that uh, people in India are experiencing these days. In this moment, uh, economics can have some answers uh, for us. And uh, to some extent, this class, which will be completely non-technical, will not rely on equations or on complicated statistics or anything like that, will be an attempt to uh, show you how in contemporary modern economics, the tools that we have can be harnessed to answer some of these hard questions. Uh, we are living hard times, we are living even harder times these days, and I'm kind of hoping that we are moving towards more hopeful time as we move along. Many of the material in this book is based, in this course, sorry, is based on, based on our book, uh, Good Economics for Hard Times, uh, but you don't need to have read the book or to read it as we go along uh, to follow the, the course. We hope, of course, that it might give you a taste to read that book or many of the other papers and studies we are going to see together. So each uh, uh, course, which will take place uh, um, every day this week and every day next week, will be divided in about two hour uh, segments. The first one is today. Uh, it's just an introduction. How, uh, how should we think about economics? And in particular, in just the US, recent US politics, is it possible to make economics great again? In a sense, most important issues we have to face are issues which are at their core have a lot of economics. They have other things as well, not just economics, but they have a lot of economics in them. We've been discussing Brexit, and it finally happened. That's, of course, a question of economics. The role of international trade, the role of migration, whether migration is good or bad for the sending economies and for the receiving countries. We're wondering about what's going to happen to economic growth in the wake of the COVID crisis. Inequality were exploding before the COVID crisis and have continued to explode even more during the crisis. Many people are rethinking social policy, are wondering whether we need to completely change the premise and the way that we think about it to make it more fair, to make it more just, to make it more effective. 
Climate change is the issue that is going to be at the core of uh, what we need to grapple together at the world over the next uh, few decades, if we still want to have a world to talk about very soon. And of course, racism, discrimination, be it against the lower caste in India, African American in the US, uh, migrants in this, this country, in France, um, are also uh, finally have, have come much more to the fore of the conversation we're having. And it's impossible to give this class uh, in the spring of 2021 without also thinking about the pandemic, its short-term and long-term economic impact, the way we need to think about the vaccines, both how to convince people in rich countries that have access to vaccines to get it, to protect others and themselves, but also uh, what is the fair and efficient way to share it with the world and how do we get there. On all of these topics, this is really economics because there are trade-offs, there is uh, uh, choices you have to make, there are of course resources to be traded. So you would think economists would really be at the core of the conversations we're having today. Not alone, of course, but they would be part of those conversations. And yet for quite some time now, uh, sadly, perhaps, at least if you are an economist, sadly, economists have lost uh, a lot of their credibility, if they ever had any, of course. Uh, this is data from a poll that was taken by YouGov uh, shortly after the Brexit vote that's asking people um, who they trust mo most among various experts. Nurses and doctors are the people who are trusted the most. This is from before the pandemic, but it remained true during the pandemic. People trust their own general practitioners, particularly. Scientists are trusted by 71% of people in the UK. Historians as well. But then if you look at politicians, they are at the total bottom of the pile. And just before politicians come economists. Only 25% of people trust economists about economics. We are not talking about trusting economists to discuss uh, uh, baseball or to discuss dating. We are talking economi about economics talking about economics. Just to see how low that is, compare that to the number of people who trust weather people. And you will find that a weatherman are trusted by 50% of people. So the trust in economists is only half of the trust in weather people. Um, and this is, mind you, in the UK, where the weather keeps changing and is particularly hard to predict. So we are starting from this very, very low level of trust for economists. Not only people do not trust economists, but they also do not agree with them. They disagree with economists on most core issues. Take this example, for example, of uh, trade, international trade. Uh, shortly after the Trump administration decided to impose uh, steel and aluminum tariffs, the same que the one question was asked to a panel of economists. Uh, the question was asking, uh, do you think imposing new U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum would improve Americans' well-being? Among uh, experts, 0% of people thought that this was going to be true. 0% thought that this, uh, these extra tariffs were going to be good for welfare. Who are they are economics professors across various institutions in the U.S. and in Europe, top institutions, in fact, Abhijit Banerjee, who is going to teach this class with me, is one of them. And none of them thought this was going to be a good idea for American welfare. Meanwhile, we asked this question, the very same question, phrased in the same way, 10,000 Americans online uh, in 2018. And out of those Americans, 33% of them thought it was a good idea. So there is a big disconnect between the view of economists and the view of the general people. In general, uh, citizens tend to be more pessimistic than economists. To give you just an example on the beliefs on migration, most economists tend to be quite hopeful about migration. As evidence, for example, in these questions that was also asked to the same panel of experts, 
Uh, the question is the influx of refugees into Germany beginning in the summer of 2015 will improve, uh, will bring economic benefits to Germany over the succeeding decades, leaving time for these migrants to adjust. You can see that 40% of economists thought it would be the case, whereas 25% of, of, of our respondents thought it would be the case. Incidentally, this pessimism was perhaps unwarranted because after all, it's one of these immigrants, not the refugees, but one of these immigrants for Turkey, a couple that founded BioNTech and was going to be at the root of the Pfizer vaccines against coronavirus. So in that particular instance, I will take the opportunity to say that the economists might have been right in their optimism since it's pretty clear uh, discovering this vaccine was going to be uh, to the advantage of the, of the German public and in fact the world. Maybe I can stop here for a, uh, for a minute for question. Okay. So, not, so one possible explanation for why people disagree with, uh, disagree with uh, economists is that they just don't know what economists uh, uh, tend to uh, recommend. Maybe economists are shy and they are not so much in the public and therefore people are not aware. So maybe if people simply listen to economists, they would understand that trade can be good for people and tariffs are certainly bad for people and that migration is good for people. Maybe that's the reason. Uh, this, exper this experiment that I'm going to talk to you about suggests that that's not the case. So if you remember, the beginning of the Yellow Vest movement in France was prompted by a very strong opposition to um, tax on, on gasoline. In general, economists and the general public tend to have very different opinions about the most efficient way to fight climate change. Economists love carbon tax, which eventually uh, get translated into uh, taxes, on, uh, taxes on, on, on gasoline. But not only, you know, anything that produces carbon. So economists love carbon tax because economists love prices and they love prices as a way to uh, incentivize people to make the decision that makes the most sense. So just to summarize the argument, if we think that uh, using your car uh, generates an externality on the world because it generates all of this carbon that contributes to the warming of the climate, then we should really discourage people to use uh, uh, their car too much or to use too much gasoline by putting a tax. In a sense that this, this tax is useful because it serves as a reminder and in, an incentive to not use too much carbon. For example, we have very heavy taxes on cigarettes because by smoking you impose a bad on people around you and people have come around to the idea that taxes on cigarettes are probably a good thing to have in society. But about carbon tax, economists and the general public strongly disagree. While economists love the instrument of a carbon tax because they think that this is the way that everybody is going to work towards more efficient car and uh, more public transport, less consumption because all of this generates carbon that is going to be priced. The public seems to tend to think that it's a very bad idea and that it's much better to have a, a mandate, for example, on car manufacturer. So instead of a tax, they want, they want to have rules that prevent directly the emission of taxes. So they don't want to, to, to use taxes as instrument to get people to behave. They want to just put constraint on what people do. So this was very evident in the Yellow Vest movement that at the root was, uh, had a very strong opposition against this idea of a carbon tax. And the underlying idea, which is, very, which is ex, uh, expressed in this t-shirt, is that uh, it says, l'argent de l'écologie est dans les paradis fiscaux, pas dans la poche des prolos, citoyens en colère, citoyens solidaires. What this means is that, look, you are asking to pay for climate change from my own pocket. So what they think, rightly, is that uh, carbon tax is going to be an immediate uh, um, 
threat on their wallets. And that's why you have the debate between the end of the month and the end of the world, where the Yellow Vest uh, movement people said, look, you guys might be concerned about the end of the world. We are concerned about trying to make it till the end of the month. To which economists would say, well, of course, it's going to affect uh, you the price that you're paying for alcohol, but uh, for, sorry, it's going to affect the prices that you're paying for gasoline. But you can be compensated. It can be done in a way that you don't have to bear the benefits. You're going to be compensated by a direct transfer. So you have the right incentive to not drive too much or to change your car if it's too old. But it is not going to come at your personal cost. And the thing is, people do not really trust that this is going to happen. They're saying, well, of course, uh, you are telling me that this is all going to be fixed ex post, but why would I trust it? And as a result, when you're asking people uh, uh, the question, do you prefer a carbon tax or do you prefer standards, uh, the majority of the experts, this is the EEP or the expert, tells that they much prefer a carbon tax. The majority of the people, this is the FTI colon here, this is a, a panel of people, uh, say that they would prefer, uh, they would not prefer a, a carbon tax. Only 22% 22, only 22 of people say that they prefer tax standard over a carbon tax. In this experiment, uh, what the researchers did is that they, say, they said to half of the people, they said at the beginning, you know, economists tend to think that the carbon tax is better than, uh, than tax standards. And then they ask exactly the same question as before. And what you can see here is that it makes absolutely no difference. People who were primed, that is, they were reminded of the opinion of economists, are still, by an overwhelming majority, likely to say that they think a, a carbon tax is better than a car standard. Uh, their answers, 25 versus 22 percent of people answering that, is very, very similar. Similarly, on NAFTA, the trade credit, they ask whether NAFTA increased uh, welfare, 95 percent of economists say that. If we rem uh, remind people that that is the case, it is still the case that only about half people think that NAFTA increased welfare. So basically, people um, are completely unswayed by what economists uh, believe. This goes with the fact that they are not trusted, and this goes with the fact that what is at the root of it is not ignorance of the position, it's basic disagreement. So basically the general public simply do not trust the economists when, when they say that this, this can all be worked out ex post. And they also don't trust politicians when they say the same thing. Perhaps for good reason, because for example in the case of the Yellow Vest movement, the uh, gasoline tax was proposed just after a reduction in the, um, uh, in the income tax and an increase in the flat tax that everybody pays. So they could see this and say this is part of a pattern of increasing the taxes on the rich and uh, lowering, the, the, uh, of lowering the taxes on the rich and increasing the taxes on the poor. Is, is there, there any question? question? Um, yes, for okay, now. So why don't we stop here? Yeah, so we can take a small break. So one question was, uh, what do you think will be the biggest post-pandemic challenge in developing countries like India? Very broad question. Uh, do you want me to ask all of them at the same time? Or uh, maybe, maybe ask two or three and then I can. Uh, yeah, and then uh, there was a question about how will the development of uh, the poor in terms of literacy uh, affect a country already having high unemployment level? So that was also a bit unclear. And so far, that's what we have. Thank you. So uh, one very broad, one very broad question of post-pandemic economy uh, um, in, in India, and one very specific question on, uh, on, on education and development. So education development will be addressed uh, a little bit uh, when we talk about economic growth. Uh, so we, I'll be happy to talk about that at that time. Uh, the post-pandemic situation of India will be addressed as we go along in many uh, circumstances. So stay tuned and we'll discuss it. So why are people, why do people mistrust economists uh, so much? Mm, maybe we shouldn't be too surprised. First 
first of all, most people think that it, the main job of economists is to be uh, forecasters. That's, that's what they do for a living. In fact, you have large departments in the IMF, in the OECD, and a whole group of professional forecasters whose job is to try to predict what's going to happen to the economy. Um, and this is a very, very difficult job. And as a result, we are just not very, very good at it. If you see, for example, in this slide, this is from a working paper by a researcher at the IMF who is trying to judge the performance of the IMF in predicting recessions. So in a recession, you can see in the black bar, uh, the economy obviously shrinks. Uh, that's the definition of a recession, by a, on average across a number of recessions, by about 3% for that year. The year before in April, so mid-year, uh, towards the beginning of the year before, the IMF was predicting an economic growth of about 3%. By October, when the year is almost over, they're still predicting for the next year an economic growth of 2%. In April of the current year, while we're already a quarter into the recession year, they're predicting a very mild recession of about minus 1%. And it's only by October that they have almost reached what is going to be the real recession of the year. So basically, they are absolutely terrible at predicting recession. In fact, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith made this quip against economists as, as uh, uh, predicting the economy, saying that the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. So maybe if we had astrologists in, in this list of experts, astrologists would be, would be trusted more than economists by the general public. This is another way to see the same thing, a graph by the, the economists. Um, you can see on the blue the, the projection of the, the, the forecast error uh, across various years in the IMF production of the GDP. And you can see a forecast error of almost 3% 21 uh, months before, which is about the same thing as if you just took uh, for your prediction the growth rate of the previous year and used the same number, which of course would be much more, much less difficult. Similarly, uh, if you picked a random number, uh, you would have a forecast error of about 4%, which is not that much worse than just uh, than the prediction, than, than the forecast error of the prediction that is made after using all of these experts doing all of these things. So I don't want to, uh, to, to be um, too uh, uh, snarky with the economists, with the IMF, because what you can see in this picture is that the consensus of professional forecasters is equally bad as the IMF is. It's just it's the case that forecasting is very difficult. To give you an example, the IMF uh, uh, had an outlook, World Economic Outlook, that came out uh, in April, where they predicted for India economic growth of about uh, of over 10 percent for the uh, uh, coming year, partly as India is recovering from a terrible recession in the first year of the pandemic. Shortly after India entered a huge second wave of the coronavirus crisis, we were just discussing it with one question from the, from the audience. Uh, this huge increase in, uh, in, in, in coronavirus cases is of course going to translate into uh, large economic pains that is already uh, means that the IMF forecast is not uh, actual anymore. And this, of course, is not something that they saw coming. It would be very difficult to saw coming. So predicting is just hard. So if most people think that the function of economy is to forecast the economy, then there is no, it's no wonder that they think uh, economists are terrible at it. But that's not quite all uh, there is. Uh, economists are often seen as being deeply ideological. And to be honest, they often are deeply ideological. Uh, it, this year is the 50th anniversary of a very well-known essay by Milton Friedman, the godfather of the Chicago School of Economics, uh, where he said the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. So once you've said that, uh, you basically lay out the, the ground of what you think business should be, what you think economics, sh economics should be, and what you think economics should be about, which is um, which clearly uh, 
demonstrates for many people the position of economics are just being in the pay, explicitly or implicitly, of business interests and too interest in defending the too interested in defending the status quo to be really interesting. So a lot of young people, idealistic people, people who want to change society, will have absolutely no interest uh, to uh, study economics because they have no interest in putting their talents to the service of this particular business. And that's not, that's not helped by the fact that most of the economists you see on television are not academic economists. They are economists uh, who represent a bank, for example, or a business house. They are doing their job. I have absolutely nothing against them. But they certainly speak from a particular corner with a particular interest. Um, the movie, for example, the movie Inside Job that some people might remember made a, a very big case out of that, which is basically the entire profession being beholden to a particular segment of society and being too ideologically committed to the status quo. This has not been helped either by uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the, um, the reaction that some people in the profession had to that movement. Uh, so the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, in starting the last uh, spring in particular in the US, uh, following exactly one year ago, uh, the murder of George, George Floyd, led to a more general reckoning about racism in American society, not just uh, police violence, which of course was the immediate uh, cause for the, uh, the immediate spark that started this, but more generally, the various ways in which uh, uh, black Americans suffer from racism uh, in, in their everyday lives. And the fact that we are seeing very few black Americans in many professions, including economics. So it became very apparent at that time, something that has always been true, which is economics is mostly a field of white men. And again, being mostly a field of white men, that uh, you would think, influences both the type of topic that we choose to address, the type of answer that we choose to address. And this was not particularly helped when the editor of a prominent uh, journal in economics uh, uh, um, uh, called some of the protesters flat earthers. Uh, so it, he, it was his right to say whatever he wanted on Twitter, but that kind of was visible enough as uh, the, the face of economics uh, to make it in the front page of the New York Times and to lead to this uh, um, a new wave of this idea that economics as a profession does not represent uh, uh, the diversity of interests and of causes that exist in society at large. So one possibility there is to say, well, you know, it is what it is. Uh, economics is a fairly narrow uh, field that uh, we should just continue to do and uh, uh, the best we can and without really worrying about what people might think of us or whether they trust us or not. And maybe we should, those who want to have uh, more of a position in society should do something else like history or sociology or medicine. Uh, but I would agree, I would respond to that, that we can't afford to give up on economics fully. And I would hope that if you're here, uh, you haven't given up on economics fully. Certainly, I have not given up on, on, on economics at all, because in fact, most economics is just not that. The vast majority of economists, professional economists, working in universities, research centers around the world, do not do forecasting. And they are not really interested necessarily in justifying the world the way it is. Instead, they study topics as wide-ranging and diverse as inequality, as poverty, what to do about it, development, racism, COVID-19, uh, how to think about vaccine patents. One of the most active debates in society today is whether there should be a waiver for vaccine patents. Of course, that's an economic issue on which a lot of economists have things to say on both ends and, and, and climate change. But the thing is, most of economics is not really flashy. So most people who have these debates, first of all, they don't come to necessarily super neat answer that can be summarized in a Twitter uh, 
uh, statement. Most of these economists, in fact, are not on Twitter anyway, and are not very present in the public debate. They sort of toil quietly in their office. And therefore, we don't really see in the public debate enough of this diversity, both of topic and of position. And in a sense, that's kind of what I would like to do in, this, in these lectures and what we try to do in this book is to give um, a voice to this profession. So don't take this class thinking this is going to be a way, an entirely new way of doing economics, a revolutionary uh, uh, perspective on the field. It, almost on the contrary, it is a way of expressing what is being done today in universities and departments across the world in this vast uh, variety of subjects. But that you might not have seen because it's relatively uh, quiet. Uh, let me stop here for, uh, and, and take any questions. Uh, yes, there's quite a few questions on, on trust and forecasting. So uh, someone is asking, uh, do you think that the mistrust comes from the methods that economists use which make economics a complex field? Another question is, considering that most economic predictions are far from the actual numbers, why do you think that forecasting has so much importance within the field? Uh, and then someone is asking, are political debates not technical enough? And should politicians or economists in television talk about, for instance, uh, statutory versus economic tax incidents, or would it be too complicated? Great. So I think uh, in terms of the methods, uh, so one of the questions was whether the methods that economists use contribute to the, the lack of trust because there is a lack of transparency. And I think that's absolutely true. This is something that I did not mention as a source of mistrust. But a lot of people will remember economics as being uh, overly technical, being full of equation to uh, sometimes the equation seems to be uh, used as a window dressing for, uh, again, justifying the status quo or, you know, just hiding your ignorance. That's why this class is going to use no equations and to show that we can do economic reasoning without equations. Um, the, the question on whether forecasting, why forecasting is such an important part of our job, of our profession, if it's so unreliable, is an excellent question. Um, I think it's because we cannot resist to want to know what's going to happen in the future. So I think there is a huge demand. Uh, in fact, if, uh, you know, if you find yourself in a taxi or in a plane and you, 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 ha you, you admit to being an economist, one of the reactions you're going to have is, oh, so what's going to happen to the economy and what's going to happen to the stock market? And in fact, one of the questions I got, we got earlier, was, what's going to happen to India after COVID? So we really have this strong demand to want to know what's going to happen in the future. And therefore, uh, uh, we, that demand comes both from, from citizens and from governments who are trying to make contingent plans. Hence the huge demand for that forecasting. But again, it's not such an important part of the job of most professional economists. It's really relatively concentrated in specialized departments. It just gets more play and more media attention, which is again why we uh, decided to do it. On the question of whether uh, policy debates need to be more technical, um, I think they need, they, ideally they would be more substantive without being overly technical. So ideally there is a way to talk about uh, the, the, the trade-offs, for example, involved in various debates, in, in, so for example, taxes, uh, uh, the question was asked was about statutory taxes versus the taxes that are actually paid. Another question, again, the, the vaccine patent debate, uh, people should, uh, we should be able to have a debate that has the pros and, the pros and, and minuses of waiving the debate without immediately getting into uh, food fights about whether this is going to be the end of innovation forever, which would be the pharmaceutical company position, or whether if you don't do that, nothing will be able to get done, uh, which is, would be the activist position. So ideally, we would have a way of explaining clearly the, the pluses and minuses, going through the meandering path uh, that we each need to go to come up to our own personal answers so that people can decide uh, for themselves, knowing all of the arguments in place. And that requires not necessarily more technicity, not necessarily 
uh, things that are hard to discuss, but maybe a little bit more time. And I think this is what we need to learn to, to do, uh, both uh, as, as economists, as a profession, as professional economists, to explain the way we are thinking and to not just uh, uh, um, speak like oracle with this is my conclusion and I'm an economist, so you better listen, because as we've seen, this is of no, that has no impact anyway, no one cares. Um, and uh, um, at the same time, um, not losing people along, along the way. So I think there is a lot of demand actually in the debate for this uh, uh, explaining of reasoning uh, without uh, necessarily insisting too much on the conclusion that people should reach. So economics is not only uh, 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 not very uh, this economics that people do on a day-to-day -day economist is not only uh, not very flashy, but it's also uh, uh, a little bit uh, modest and humble as a field. Um, some of you might remember or might watch the Big Bang Theory, uh, which is basically uh, full of physicists making fun of engineers. So the physicists are the one who have the real uh, science at their disposal. They keep making fun of the engineers who are basically tinkering with their, with their machines. I would, agree that I would argue that economists are one uh, a step below the engineers. They are more plumbing than even engineers. Uh, a lot of economics, is, uh, um, economics research is really about figuring out details about uh, both the impact of policies and why a particular way of implementing these policies has such a different effect than an other way. So a lot of economics uh, and economics papers are about are going quite finely into details. And these plumbing questions turn out to be absolutely essential in many questions, going from taxation, for example. If you want to have high taxes, that's very nice, but there is going to be a leaky pipes issue with tax evasion, for example. So fixing, uh, thinking about taxation, you cannot just think about in abstract about what would be the optimal taxation on the rich people without thinking how do you put in place the system such that you actually are able to raise all of this, uh, to raise all of this money. So that's an example where plumbing and fixing leaks is absolutely essential, and that's the work of economists, in a sense, on a day-to-day -day basis, much more than the forecasting we're seeing. So this work is quite of quite details, and uh, but from detail to detail, we get to uh, understand a little bit better what policies can be effective, what policy is not effective, and why. And so this is uh, a lot of this courses uh, in the next uh, is, are going, is going to be about uh, uh, going into these details, getting our hand dirty and uh, understanding how it works. And it is pretty essential because policymakers are not always deeply focused on those details. Uh, policymakers often like to take the bird's eye view, think about the big principle behind the policy, and then sort of hope that, put it in place, send bureaucrats or technocrats to write the details and hope it works out. And by not being interested in the details, often you have situations where you have the right intention, you have the right idea, but what you have at the end of the day is not what you were planning to have. So what I'm going to do uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so uh, is to give you a little preview of uh, the entirety of the course with five lessons uh, that are really going to run through all of the different uh, um, uh, lectures in the course and why they remain valid uh, through our harder times. So they are not going to be, I'm not going to give you a preview of the various uh, uh, topics we are going to address. Instead, I'm going to give you uh, some summaries that we're getting uh, that, are, that we are going to find over and over and over again across the different chapters we are going to treat. The first one concerns the legitimacy of governments. Uh, even uh, ever since the, the, the mid-90s, early 2000s, 
there has been a steady decline of trust in governments. If you remember in the YouGov poll that I showed you, the least trusted people were not the economists, but, but politicians. In general, uh, across OECD country, there is a decline in trust in government year on year on year on year. And sometimes this, this reaches some pretty extreme levels. Uh, for example, during uh, uh, the Obamacare discussion, uh, there were people demonstrating with placards saying, keep government out of my Medicare. Medicare being, of course, the government program on health insurance. So the mistrust in government is becoming so strong that people do not even see when the government is at the heart of the programs that they are trying to, uh, to protect. It is easy to treat the government as a punching bag. Uh, we all have in, uh, in our lives experiences of the governments or, uh, or, or its bureaucrats not working the way that we would expect them to do. Uh, it is in fact uh, a bit of a spot among economists to insist on corruption, on misgovernance, on wasted, wasted resources in government. But what we forget is that governments intervene precisely where uh, the uh, private sector was, uh, uh, was unable to do uh, what it wanted to do. That governments come in when things are hard. And that's why governments find it harder than firms often to do their job. It's not because they are less competent, it's because the job is so much harder. And often when we are seeing the pub private, public, private sector tries to do the same thing, for example, allocating scarce resources to people not based just on money, we're finding massive failure and corruption in private firms as well. The COVID-19 crisis has reminded us why we need governments. We've seen it in so many instances. Uh, wearing a mask, shutting your businesses, all of that, these are externalities, it's something you do for others mainly. And so you are not you know, really wanting to do it most of the time, and you only do it because there is a government to tell you there is a mandate, this is not a choice. Only governments can put uh, the amount of money that was necessary to develop vaccines. Only governments and rich governments at that were able to borrow massively to finance the economic rescue package that kept us alive during the pandemic. And now only governments have the legitimacy to decide in what order people get the vaccine. And when, you know, for example, and have to choose between uh, uh, expanding eligibility in richer countries, including to children, versus opening to poor countries. So this crisis has reminded us why we need government. And in fact, trust in government has, has, is very strongly correlated with success against COVID-19. You can see in this graph uh, different countries, and you can see uh, on the um, x-axis the percentage of population that report that they trust the government, and up there are uh, the, the, the deaths uh, from COVID. And you can see that among the successful government, we have uh, autocracy and democracy. Among the least successful government, we have that as well. But the main defining factor is, do you trust your government? And in a sense, this has been, probably still is, in many places, a make or break moment. Because at the same time that people recognize that they can't go with the, the government, they also really resent the uh, intrusion of the government in their place. This is a demonstration among uh, restriction in the US, but I could have taken a photo from Marseille and finding exactly the same demonstration or from Berlin in Germany. Where, so people at the same time see the government much more present in their life, need it more, and resent it more. And therefore, where it's going to go, the legitimacy of government as a result of the COVID-19 crisis is going to be very closely related with our ability uh, and with the government's ability to succeed. Before the next lesson, let me take a question from the... Yes, um, there's quite some questions on trust again. So one question is what would be a scientific approach to handle mistrust? And uh, in general, how can we increase trust in experts and science-based uh, policymakers among the public and the government? 
Um, another question is if we try a more scientific approach to overcome this problem of mistrust in economists with, for example, our cities, uh, will economists only be able to perform case studies and not answer big questions? And then, uh, does mistrust in economists have the capacity to strongly affect the real economy in terms of uh, confidence and, and disruption? Great, thank you for, uh, very much for these great questions. So, I guess the last question of the trade-off between the plumbing that economists could do and the big questions is a little bit related to this, why are we still forecasting when we know we're bad at it? In the same way, I think you know, this shows how strong the, 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 uh, the, the, the pressure, the willingness to try to address the e enormous question like, for example, how can we ensure there is economic growth? Uh, how strong this pressure is, and therefore why there is still you know, effort that is devoted to this task. The issue is that it's very difficult. So if we cannot provide a satisfactory answer to this question, and we will see in the, when we study the growth that economists are basically being completely unable to answer these questions, then we do very little to ensure uh, trust. And maybe it is safer to retreat in more uh, um, modest uh, goals that can be uh, ambitious as well. For example, description of historical events or um, uh, they can be more narrow-minded, for example, program evaluation via randomized control trials, uh, but then give very solid answer to these questions. And I think this is probably going to be a recipe for being more uh, trusted and therefore more effective in society than just saying, well, this is my word, just listen to me. This is my answer to your big question. Of course, I can't really prove it because that's a difficult question, but just believe me. Uh, w in the course of, the, of, of, of these lectures, we'll have a chance to discuss how to discuss, <laughs> which is going to be a little bit, what is the research of uh, how to uh, convince people? So uh, how, what is effective to convince people in a conversation? Uh, and, and therefore, I think, answer in more detail that questions of a sort of scientific approach to trust building and the role that uh, we need to play in how we have, the, uh, we have our conversation in this case. The second lesson that, is going, that we are going to see running through uh, all of the lectures uh, in, in, this two, in, in this course is the idea that financial incentives are uh, overrated. And perhaps that has been demonstrated once more very strongly during the pandemic. So financial incentives, uh, as I already alluded in the case of the carbon tax, are beloved by economists. Economists think that they are making the world tick, that this is what people respond to the most. They are not just be beloved by economists, they are something that we all pretty strongly believe in. Uh, when you're thinking about uh, uh, the poor, for example, you always hear policymakers and often citizens as well saying, "Well, we shouldn't be too uh, we shouldn't be too generous towards the poor, because if they don't, if they have uh, a steady income stream, they won't have the incentive to work hard in order to generate to generate money to survive." In other words. If we are too generous with those who are struggling, uh, we might uh, make them lazy. So there is this very strong myth or perception that uh, welfare recipients are, are lazy and we shouldn't give them too much money to avoid making them lazy. And in fact, we will see in this course many, many instances of evidence where this simply is not true empirically. This is just doesn't happen to be the case. And I'll show you just one example today, which is uh, there are now around the world many instances of cash transfer program to the poor. And this cash transfer program sometimes uh, ask the families to obtain vaccinations or education for their children, but never to work. So it's completely unconditional on whether or not they work. And these programs have been evaluated via randomized control trials in many countries. So we are able to compare 
strictly comparable people with the same rigor as a, a vaccine trial uh, who have received pretty generous financial help to people who are exactly comparable who have not received that financial help. And that financial help is completely independent on them working. So if money was really making the poor lazy, we should see that the people who receive the financial help are in fact working less. And you can see here in gray the people who didn't get the help and in red the people who got the help. And you can see that the people who got the help are about as likely to have worked last week as the people who didn't get the help. And the people who, uh, and they also worked about the same number of hours as the people who didn't get the help. So there is absolutely no evidence across a range of country uh, here in uh, in Latin America, but also in the Philippines and in Morocco, that, uh, work, that receiving money that helps you to, uh, to survive and helps you to feed your family uh, um, discourages you from working. During the COVID pandemic, uh, there was, uh, f at least for, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of consensus, uh, both in Europe and in the US, that it was absolutely essential to support people financially in order to make sure that they actually comply with lockdown restriction and that the entire economy was would not collapse. Uh, this is something that was mainly done in the rich country because the poor countries couldn't afford it. In the US, the way it was done is by uh, letting people go on, the, on unemployment, but if they went on unemployment, by giving them very generous unemployment benefits of about 600 per week. So, uh, people uh, uh, immediately started looking at whether with this very generous unemployment, often much more generous than they would have gotten if they were working, uh, if they kept in their work, you would see people to stop working. And what you see in this graph is the result from a study by Yale Economist that is looking at uh, uh, the different um, um, places in the US, different states in the US, uh, organized by how generous the $600 a week were in comparison to what people would have gotten if they kept their job. And you can see, for example, the red line is states that would have got, gotten five times more money if they go on unemployment than if they continue to work. So very, very generous replacement ratio. Uh, in, in dark, you see the, 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 when the, the program started, the economies, of course, collapse uh, just before that. And um, people work less in places where the replacement ratio were generous. Of course, this is why the replacement ratio were particularly generous, because these are the places that suffer the most from the crisis. But what you do not see is people in those places working less and less and less and less because they, are, they have it so much better on unemployment than on work. In fact, you're seeing, if anything, the opposite, which is people in the red line that start much below the people in the blue and green line trying to catch up and working more. So if anything, places where the uh, unemployment help was more generous, uh, that helped them go back to work a little bit faster. Uh, this is only one of about half a dozen studies of this program in the US that all shows the same thing that this super generous unemployment insurance program did not discourage people to work. And on the contrary, was instrumental in keeping the economies afloat so people could go back to work faster. But, this, but uh, some ideas are, are hard to root out. And the idea that uh, if you pay people not to work, fewer will work uh, is one of those ideas. So the Wall Street Journal titled, uh, in reviewing this Yale study, titled Economist versus Common Sense. The common sense being, of course, people will stop working if you're paying them not to work. And the Yale Economist being wrong. Even though it was not just a Yale Economist, it was half a dozen studies all finding the same thing. But that's, you know, for the Wall Street Journal, is I have my ideology, you have your facts. Your fact must be wrong because my ideology must be correct. Similarly, Chuck Grassley, a Republican of Iowa, very quickly in the pandemic said, this discourages people to work, from returning to work, taking a new job, delaying the recovery, uh, despite the evidence that showed the opposite. So in fact, this uh, program 
was abandoned uh, fairly quickly into the pandemic and was never replaced in that particular form, showing the force of, of those prejudices. But this idea that people are much less sensitive to financial incentive than we often believe is something we are going to see a lot of. The third lesson we are going to see uh, throughout uh, this, uh, uh, these courses is the idea that the economy is very sticky. So economists often like to think of the economy as something which is always fluid and movement. So if someone, for example, lo loses their job in Idaho, they can always move and take a job in California. If someone loses their job in Morocco, they have only one desire is to migrate to Spain in order to, uh, to get a job there. If someone faces a drought in Senegal, they are going to come and they are going to come to this country and find another job to, uh, and, and find a job there. So the idea that there is always movement. In fact, there is, le there is relatively little movement. And in fact, in a country like the US, for example, which Tocqueville really lauded for its uh, dynamism and the fact that the Americans are restless, uh, when he visited, the, the Americans are less and less restless. In fact, since 1948, there has been almost a halving of, the, uh, of mobility from county to county. In uh, 1948, 13.6 people moved from one county to the next within a year. And in 2016, that was, uh, uh, was 6.9%. And that mobility continued to decline up to the pandemic where, of course, everybody was frozen in place. So people within the US move much less than they have uh, historically. That's true within Europe where people don't move that much. And it's also true across country. The pandemic has, of course, uh, been disastrous for migrants, in particular in the global south. All of authorization to move have been uh, canceled. But even within countries, uh, this is a photo of migrants from India who were given a few hours, basically, to figure something out when the first lockdown was decided last in the spring of 2020. So these people who had uh, abandoned everything, lived in their work site, etc., suddenly found themselves without a job, without a house, and without a claim to welfare because that was related to their home place. And so that left a very, very bitter taste in their mouth. And af after, when the economy recovered after that, they were very reluctant to go. So things had become even stickier than they used to be before. Let me stop here uh, for question. Um, yes, there's questions on financial incentives. Um, someone is asking, so why are financial incentives not as effective as it is usually perceived? Uh, someone else is asking if financial incenti incentives don't work, what do you think are the alternatives? And a third person is asking, uh, won't it be wrong to say that financial incentives do not work? And uh, that person is quoting a paper by Banerjee et al. from 2021 um, that found that in a policy with SMS reminders, um, incentives basically led to an increase in immunization. Uh, so let me start with this last question. So that paper showed that so what we, that paper showed that uh, um, small uh, incentive led to an increase in immunization, but that same paper also showed that it's uh, about as effective and much less cost effective than to get someone in the community to advocate for immunization. So in a sense, you get this here, which is. Uh, financial incentives have an effect sometimes. It's just that it's not the main driver in a lot of cases. It's not as powerful a driver of people's behavior as we think it is. And what's the, what is the alternative? It is uh, something that I'm going to come in a minute, which is uh, dignity, which is people want position in society. People want uh, an integration in the social network. People want to feel that their life is worth something and people want to be, live in uh, uh, indignity. Which doesn't mean that uh, once all of that is established, a small incentive might, could act, for example, in the case of immunization, as a reminder to do it today versus tomorrow. But for example, a financial incentive is never going to encourage someone who really doesn't want to get immunized to get immunized. So it's not going to move people's preferences. 
It might just help people who was going to do it anyway to nudge them to go in that direction. So that relates to an the first question I, I left unanswered, partly because it's coming now, which is, uh, if not financial incentive, then what? Like, what is it that actually drives people? What is in people's... Uh, how come people are not responding to the incentive, and uh, despite the fact that we think it's, the, it's, it's so strongly the case? It's related to another characteristic of, uh, of, um, of people, which is maybe their preferences are not as strongly established as we think they are. So there is a, a, a very uh, famous uh, saying, de gustibus non est disputandum. De, um, de goût et de couleur, on ne discute pas en français. You're not disputing taste. Uh, which uh, um, a, paper, a paper by one uh, other uh, Chicago uh, uh, godfather, uh, Becker, uh, um, took as a title, which says, well, you know, people have preferences. They come, they are deep and strongly established, and we can't really change them. So the only way to change people's behavior is not by changing people's uh, uh, preferences, is by changing the set of prices that are going to move them in one direction or the other. So the, 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 par the, kind of the counterpart to the fact that incentives matter or not is the fact that preferences are, are established or not. One of these preferences, of course, that is the most uh, uh, in, you know, howling and discussed today uh, in the US is the idea of is racism. Uh, partly because the pandemic put racial inequality into focus with the COVID-19 uh, uh, hitting the black population in the US so much strongly than the white population. So age adjusted, a black person was four times as likely to die as COVID, uh, from COVID as a white person in the US. And of course, with the um, um, with the death of George Floyd and uh, the, the, the spotlight that it put on, on police violence uh, exactly one year ago, leading to the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations. The racist element was also obvious, just plain obvious, in the Capitol attack, as you can see from the fact that this man is wearing a Confederate flag uh, inside the Capitol. So you might think, for example, that the U.S. is just simply a, a, a deeply uh, div uh, divided society, divided on these preferences, on what you th on things as fundamental of what you think of people who happen not to share the color of your skin. But, and in fact, there is a lot of discussion now on uh, the fact that uh, the attitude towards COVID seems to be related to these preferences. So people, for example, who are Republican are much more likely to be uh, uh, hesitant of getting a vaccine. Uh, um, Democrats are more likely to be wearing a mask and so on and so forth. But uh, what we, we found uh, in our work is that that is true in levels, but that is not true in terms of people's sensitivity to uh, what you tell them. So we did a, a series of, of uh, studies with uh, doctors uh, from an MGH working with the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. So we had doctors like this Dr. Gracia Cuete of various gender, race, age, etc. I uh, show short uh, 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 snippets of information about COVID-19, and then we in interviewed people who saw the snippets about various attitudes. In general, you're thinking, for example, how much people would be willing to pay for a mask. We're seeing that African-Americans are most wi willing to pay for a mask, willing to pay the most for a mask. Uh, uh, white Democrats are come next, and finally white Republicans come, come next. So that is true. It seems to be related to who you are, the color of your skin, and your political opinion. However, if you compare the blue line to the red line, this is the effect of the intervention. And what you can see is that among all groups, seeing these doctors telling you it's important to wear a mask, this is what COVID is and it's important to wear a mask, moved people's opinion uh, towards uh, uh, being more accepting of wearing a mask. So it is not the case that people are so entrenched in their opinion that they cannot listen. And that is 
for another uh, variable we had in this case is how much people would be willing to give to a, a COVID-19 charity focused on black people versus everyone. And we saw the same thing, that even a white Democrat who uh, without intervention would give less, are also moved uh, by, this, by this intervention to be willing to give more to a charity focusing on, on blacks. So, the, so it is not true that people's preferences are entrenched and solid, even when they look like that. You can actually have a conversation and kind of move people a lot. And this is something that we are going to keep seeing, which is people often actually have no idea what they want. And therefore, they are influenced by what other people do around them, what, you know, how they woke up in that particular day, the, message, the messages that they are hearing on that day, and therefore they can be changed. And we shouldn't take preferences as something that we can't move and we can't manipulate. In fact, they can be the product of the, they are the product of the social environment. And therefore, the way that we interact together as society has impact for what people decide to do and how they decide to talk to each other. With perhaps one exception, which is the key role of dignity, which seems to always come back at the end of it, that the most important thing is not so much money, it's not so much you know, whether you get a bigger car or, or, or a bigger vacation, is uh, not even necessarily what you do in your job, but whether this is a job that has meaning, whether you are integrated in a society, whether you, are, you feel that you're respected in your family and your group. In, uh, in just before the, uh, the capital attack, shortly before the capital attack, the house of Mitch McConnell, the, the senator, the Republican uh, senator leader, was vandalized. Uh, and someone wrote, Mitch McConnell kills the poor. And that was a reaction to the refusal of the Senate to pass the, uh, 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 the most generous version of the, the rescue bill. But more generally, there is some truth to that. If you're looking at, and it's not just Mitch McConnell, of course, who kills the poor, but the entire uh, American system is set up in a way that literally kills the poor. If you're looking at the expected age of death as a function of where you sit in, where you sit in the household income distribution, you can see here that, of course, women live longer than men. We uh, already knew that. But uh, people uh, who are uh, richer, so they are closer to the 100 percentile, they are making $2 million uh, a year, um, um, have a higher expected age of death as people who are poorer. For example, someone, a man who is making uh, $25,000 a year, so is, a 20, is just at the bottom quintile of the US population, has, uh, will live till about 77 years whereas a, a man who is making $2 million a year will live till 87 uh, years. So a difference, in about 10, a difference of about 10 years. So literally, we live in a system, or the US, in the US, we live in a system that kills the poor. This comes from any number of factors, but something that has been uh, uh, emphasized as a key factor in the US society in the last few years is uh, what Anne Kitt and Angus Deaton have called death of despair, which is death from suicide, uh, opioid um, overdose, and alcohol poisoning. And you can see since 2000, the map becoming darker and darker, indicating that there is more and more and more of this death of despair. So one of the ways in which the US is killing the poor is by leading them, committing them, to, uh, leading them either to drug abuse or to suicide. And that's related to this question of dignity. That's related, as we will see in more detail when we discuss uh, in that part of the course, that's related to people having a sense that they are not uh, respected, they don't have, they're, they're marrying less, they're, more le they're less likely to have a job, and so on and so forth. So the role of dignity uh, in our preferences is perhaps the one thing that is the most uh, um, permanent and the most at risk in our, uh, in our hard times. So I'll conclude this introductory segment by highlighting three opportunities from the COVID crisis, 
on which we'll come back uh, also along the way in, in, the, in the course. The first one is to precisely to think about this dignity point and say that this loss of dignity uh, that people feel that their experience uh, today in the US is related to the fact that we don't have a social protection system that uh, is equipped to handle the shocks that people are facing with automation, with trade, etc. In particular, in a world where people are less mobile and less restless than we think they are. Uh, as I mentioned, in rich societies, the COVID-19 led to a huge overhaul of how we are thinking, at least tempor uh, temporarily, about social protection. Suddenly, everybody found uh, themselves in a position where they needed help, and they got it in a relatively seamless, rapid, help, uh, helpful way, and without the, the, all the jump that you have to usually go through in order to pretend to help. So is it going to be maybe one uh, thing that makes us think a citizen of, is it, shouldn't be uh, the system that we would like to have uh, with us, not in response to this once in a lifetime crisis, but in, in a more permanently to help people who, del who deal with crisis on an every on a day to day uh, basis uh, to, to, to cope with it. The second is, the, is uh, climate change. So as I mentioned, preferences are much more f flexible and movable than we think they are. And one place where it's going to become really handy is because we have to adapt the way we consume in order to fight climate change. We have to do other things, but that's one of the things we have to do. We have to consume. We have in rich countries to somehow consume less or to consume in a way that is more uh, protective of the climate. During the COVID-19 crisis, we learned two things. Uh, the first one is that sometimes scientists are right and nature is stronger than us and the catastrophe that is predicted actually happened. And we also learned that, well, you know, we can adjust to live slightly differently, to consume differently. There are things that we miss terribly, but taking the metro is maybe not one of them. And so we can see that we can adjust. And in, in fact, after when there was election in France, right after, in, after the first wave of the COVID-19 crisis, the, 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 the election put a, brought a lot of uh, Green Party uh, um, leadership at the head of, of cities all over France, which was a response to this, I think, two phenomena. So the question is, can we leverage this moment uh, to try to get serious in the fight against climate change. And the last one, I did put a, a question mark on because I have, uh, I, I am hopeful and fearful at the same time, is whether or not this is also a moment to indicate to the, our sense that there is in fact a shared destiny between rich and poor countries and a global common good. All of the right words are being said that the pandemic is a global crisis that unless it is solved everywhere, it is not going to be solved anywhere. And the IMF just put out a working paper on a blog calling for uh, enough investments to uh, solve the COVID, crisis, the COVID crisis everywhere now. And they propose a price tag of $50 billion um, to, to do that and to vaccinate the world. The question is, is it going to happen? Right now we've, hear, we've heard the world. Uh, we've heard the sense that we are in this, we are interconnected like we maybe we didn't realize so strongly before. Uh, if we seize the moment, that can be a chance to uh, reinstitute that global solidarity. If we don't, then it's going to be a wasted opportunity or worse. Let me take some questions and then we'll take a very brief pause and uh, move to our second lecture for today. Thank you. So we have one question on Zoom. Uh, v, please go ahead, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, the, you, you talked a little bit about depths of despair and um, the age, uh, your life expectancy across, across different groups. Are the same effects also seen in like France and other places? No, I, the, the death of despair is a uniquely American phenomenon for the moment. 
So if you're looking at the mortality in, uh, in before the pandemic, so in the years before the pandemic, the overall life expectancy for the first time was declining in the US, uh, but this was not true in other rich economy, and this was not true in the US, it was uniquely a phenomenon of white, uh, work, white uneducated uh, groups. So this is not only an American phenomenon as opposed to a, a phenomenon that we find everywhere in the world for the moment, uh, but it's also a white American phenomenon. That makes sense, thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, so one person asked, uh, the case studies in this lecture appear to be Europe or US focused. Can we assume the conclusions uh, that are drawn here necessarily extend to other countries, economies, or social structures. Um, someone's asking whether you think there is a problem in the way that we presently calculate GDP. Um, is it time that indicators of social economic welfare take precedence over productivity and efficiency? Uh, one person asked uh, whether, I mean, they say that economists usually detach from the moral implications that programs entail uh, and beyond their effectiveness, should economists have a say on, for instance, some financial incentives are morally correct or wrong? Uh, so let me take this, this three already. Uh, so uh, it would not be right to assume that what is said about rich countries apply to other countries or even what is said as we were just discussing, the death of despair is a u uniquely American phenomenon. We don't find it in other countries. So this course is going to go uh, all over the world. Uh, we are going to discuss both things that are particularly German to rich countries and things that are German to poor countries. And for once, we are trying to not have the divide that either we are discussing development or we are discussing rich economies. This is a course about attempting to be about the world. But of course, uh, it's going, well, uh, as a result, I'm going to try to always make very clear whether I'm talking about the US, I'm talking about G continental Europe, I'm talking about, or I'm talking about India or a particular country in Africa. We have to be sensitive about the context and um, not all lessons apply everywhere equally. That is absolutely true. Um, there was a question about GDP. And yeah, GDP. No, GDP is a terrible way to measure, uh, to measure welfare. So in fact, in we'd have, when we talk about economic growth, we are going to be discussing a lot about GDP. And that's a big, uh, it's, it is actually, a, 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 it, it is such a bad way to uh, measure the success of nation that it is actually become instrumentally bad, which is having that particular, the focus on this one measure of, of welfare has led to policy distortions. Uh, that we will uh, go over in particular when we discuss uh, in the chapter on economic growth. That's, for, that's completely obvious in discussion on climate, that sometimes you want to have less growth and more welfare. Uh, then there was a question on the moral uh, implication of, of incentives or of, of policies in general. Uh, I think it's a discussion that's harder to have in the abstract and easier to have when we think about impacts uh, uh, a particular program, for example. But yes, it is something we take into account. For example, there are discussions on if you give people stronger incentives to stay in their job or to do their job, do you select people who then will have, will be particularly motivated by money and therefore less likely to do uh, the rest of their job well? Or, you know, do you get different uh, outcomes when you uh, insist on a moral reason to do a behavior as opposed to an instrumental reason to do a behavior. That's something that we'll be able to, to address on a on case-by-case uh, basis. Um, and then there's three more questions. Okay, okay let's take the three more questions. Yeah. Um, so one person asked, uh, are there any dangers of um, economic manipulation for the purpose of uh, political goals or aims? Uh, so political manipulation of uh, economic research. Um, one person ask, uh, asks, do we have a better chance of fighting climate change by individual action to consume differently or should we uh, better rely on the price uh, controls, uh, on price controls such as the climate club proposed by Nordhaus? And the third question, uh, would you agree that economists have so far only interpreted the world while the point is to change it? Um, 
So on the last question, that debate of whether economists should be just interpreting the world and, or, or they should try to change it, is actually a debate that is in the profession, a part of the profession, in particular the more like the Chicago School, claims to want to be purely descriptive, claim to want to be positive, uh, descriptive things. But in fact, by being positive is also normative, because if you're saying I'm not going to do any, any intervention in the world, you're also saying the social you know, responsibility of a firm is to maximize its profit, which obviously also has implication in the world. So I am strongly of the belief that economists need to be, uh, agree <laughs> to be normative, which is to make propositions. And not only, once you agree that you have to make propositions, then you also agree that you can make mistakes and therefore you need to evaluate this proposition. So this goes with this, you know, being, uh, pretending that we just are descriptive and we are not normative at all, we are just making prescription. It's actually a way of making prescription without saying it and therefore being the most dangerous. So I think it is very important to be explicitly normative and make prescription and go ahead with our prescription and then, you know, show evidence on, and if the evidence doesn't exist, generate it, which is why a lot of my work uh, has been uh, uh, to, uh, to evaluate the impact of possible policies. Uh, I will postpone the question on climate because we have, we'll have two lectures on climate and we'll discuss on these issues of individual behavior, prices, institutions, government policies. This is at the core, in a sense, of the climate, uh, of the climate conversation. And remind me the first question. Uh, the first question was about the political manipulation of the economic. Yes, yes, of course. Which is not, you know, politicians manipulate everything, <laughs> uh, and uh, willingly or you know, consciously or unconsciously. But that's a reason to be as clear and transparent and open as possible in order for this manipulation to not not take place. All right. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this. Is our, the end of our introduction session. We have uh, uh, 40 minutes less left uh, for our second lecture, which is uh, the beginning of our discussion about migration. So people who thought that uh, this uh, first lecture had too many examples of US and Europe, we are going to now uh, uh, visit a little bit the rest of the world as well.